The map could be changing in the next 20, 30, 40 years. How can we acknowledge what divides us before mm -hmm. we can acknowledge what unites us? That will then kind of bridge the gap of whether or not we'll end up as a cappuccino, as yeah. you said. Social media incentivizes binary thinking. Mm -hmm. You either are with us or against us. You yeah. either agree or disagree. Everyone in the same room, they would not be talking like this. When we talk about cultural change or shift, I think there needs to be something that happens that kind of circles back in order for there to be a new normal that we discover. If you picture it as a pendulum swinging, mm. it has to swing so far to one direction in order for it to come back in another direction. Does that mean that all the wars and everything that's happening right now politically, is that what's pushing us? Um, I am not a feminist. Mm -hmm. I do not agree with this like modern day feminism that has kind of uh, trickled from the West into the way that we understand feminism mm -hmm. in the Arab world. We had feminism before anyone even assigned a term to it. Sara Alagrubi, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So Sara, you are a socio I have to say this right, socio-anthropological researcher. Yes. And an author and an artist. Yes. Uh, you're also half Emirati, half Syrian. I am. And um, you talk a lot about cultural identity and... You know, you, I, I have also heard you say that you're a contrarian, which yes. we'll get into later. And mm -hmm. I really want to know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you get into what you're doing? And what do you, what would you say that you do in your own words? Oh, that's the reason why I think you read it from the profile and also yeah. from my bio. I feel like I'm a Jane of all trades and a master of none. Okay. So I have many different titles and they just come together as this amalgamation of just an umbrella term of I'm this, dash, this, dash, mm -hmm. this, dash, this. So um, so I've been getting into social anthropology, ethnography, I mean, let's say 10, 15 years. Uh, the okay. first time I did anything to do with Emirati marriages or infographics was probably in 2012. And is that something that you've studied in university and college or is that something that you do as a passion? Are those So I took courses here and there. I don't right. have any kind of degree in social anthropology, mm -hmm. and but most of my research and actually, uh, actually all of my research that I've been doing uh, from the perspective of scholarly research and uh, academic research has been under the umbrella of social anthropology because okay. it's just, because I'm a living experience of that, I really want to find research that can support that. And I really mm -hmm. want to see people like myself reflected in that type of research. And since I haven't yeah. found it recently, I was like, well, might as well do it myself. So that's what I've done. That's a very interesting like trajectory of like a career and, you know, something that you've chosen to do in life. What, how did you get there? Was there something that happened, you know, in childhood? Was there a trigger in your upbringing or, you know, was it just a kind of a result of being uh, bicultural and... Um, what was it exactly? I think it was more along the lines of the fact that my identity, or at least the duality of my identity, only was really foregrounded when I moved back to the UAE. Mm. When I was abroad, it wasn't something that I really led with. Because, Where were you abroad? Oh, Brussels, Turkey, like okay. all over the place, because my father was a diplomat, so we lived all over. Got it. So... Um, so it was never something that was like a main kind of sticking point for conversations. Mm. It was only when I moved back to the UAE where the sort of, I guess, tribal li lineage or affiliation really was something that you led with in terms of your identity markers. Right. And then I always found it really funny because when we would have conversations about people's heritage or background, it was almost like their identity or the way that they were positioned themselves in society was sort of wrapped up in a pretty red bow mm. through the lens of their identity, through the lens of their background. And I was, and it always struck me as very strange. Right. So that's where the sort of, I guess, curiosity went. And then I just ran with that curiosity. I guess because when you live in the West, you know, you, you I mean, talking about your culture is just it's so free. You can talk about, you can say, you can identify with whatever you want mm -hmm. culturally, really. Mm -hmm. So when you came here, I'm sure you were just a bit like, okay, why can't I say that? Why can't, were you kind of shunned away from saying that you are, half Syrian? I, I wouldn't say shunned away, but it definitely <laughs> was one of those comments that if I said, oh, but I'm half Syrian, they're like, oh, that makes sense. As if it was a ah. sort of, uh, 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 like a sigh of relief. They'd be like, oh, I, I understand why you are the way that you are, which was then where the sort of, I guess, ethnographic, uh, behavioral psychology, anthropology came into play, where, where mm. I used to think I, I, didn't I didn't really realize that there were so many factors that people or characteristics and attributes that people had that mm. was so intrinsically linked to their ethnic background, or at least 
the perception of it linking to their ethnic background. Right. So for me, it was so normal for me to sort of self-identify as half Emirati, half something else. Yeah. And um, whilst when you kind of are living under a very patrilineal um, umbrella or a patrilineal legacy. What's a pa- what does that mean? Uh, so patrilineal is like they f- follow by way of the father. Okay. So because if you follow by way of the father, everything sort of uh, attributes to the father, the last name, the religion, the nationality, et cetera. Mm. And also the, the, the ethnic uh, identifying marker. So if you're, for example, half Lebanese, half American, and your father's Lebanese, then you are you self identify as Lebanese right. rather than half and half. Okay, and and so at least at least within the GCC, that's kind of the umbrella thing, the norm. Yeah, yeah. What is the difference between patriarchal and pa- uh, patrilinear? So patriarchal is like uh, the I guess uh, social uh, stratification of society built under sort of men. Okay, and then um, patrilineal is the legacy, the lineage of right. of the father. Okay, so I'm already learning. You have so matrilineal much and then patrilineal. So <laughs> guys, write these words down, okay? Sorry, <laughs> just like <laughs> we are learning serious stuff, for yeah. serious business here. Okay, so how did you feel growing up? Uh, you know, half a Marathi, half Syrian. Did you feel like you had to learn certain things or unlearn certain things to feel like that you ha- that so you could, that you could fit in? Were there certain things you had to learn? Oh, I think no, just because of this kind of contrarian. Yeah. Uh, uh, like a descriptor that you had mentioned Mm. uh, earlier on, probably off off camera. But um, for me, it was that because I grew up in a very international um, uh, schooling or international environment where people from all walks of life, Mm. uh, even in Brussels, I mean, one of the highest rates of mixed race uh, identity, black and white, is in Belgium. So I grew up with a lot of biracial children. And so for us, the idea of having, like, it was almost the norm was to be mixed. It mm. was never to be sort of like from one place. You hardly ever found a parent that, oh, hardly ever found a child that had a parent from both places. Wow. So, um, do you know what the percentage is? Sorry to cut off your yeah, trail no, of thought, but like the percentage of like the, um, Brussels versus, because I thought like Dubai is definitely the most multicultural, like uh, in they, terms of mixed. They are. I mean, the UAE, of course, it's an entrepot of like, yeah, m- UAE. M- you know, uh, different cultures and identity. But in Belgium, it's more like um, Belgium versus somebody else. So it would be like the father or the mother was Belgian and the and the the mother was like from the Congo or was Cuban oh. or was etc. So that's the the halfies were very much uh, yeah. mixed race. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, let's go into like cultural identity a little bit, just sure. because you've already you we've, we were touching up on you know uh, the multicultural kind of cities mm-hmm. and uh, Brussels and, and UAE. So I've I'm kind of the same. I grew up I'm Palestinian Jordanian, born in Kuwait, grew up in Saudi, lived in Australia, <laughs> now live in Dubai. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know what to call myself. I'm like a fifth fifth culture kid or yes. something. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know? I, I resonate with that. You, yeah. I'm sure, and a lot of people do, you know, a lot of people who grew up in the GCC do definitely resonate with that. And I feel like when it comes to identifying yourself culturally, it's hard to say where you're from. Mm-hmm. You know, when someone asks me, where are you from? I'm like, I say, I say Jordanian. Sometimes I say, it just depends sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. What do you think people can do to feel more grounded in their cultural identity because I feel like there are choices obviously you can either learn a language learn your mother tongue of Mm -hmm. Arabic or whatever it is Mm -hmm. Um, you can take on a religion you can take on the music the food the art whatever it is but for someone who's feeling really lost or suffering Mm -hmm. from this like cultural identity crisis what do you think someone can do? Well, first of all, I would start off with the idea of being comfortable residing in the non-binary way of living, which mm-hmm. is that you don't have to be one or the other. You can be a mixture of both. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is where at least I sit very comfortably. I sit very happy in the gray or happy in the middle. Okay. I can cherry pick what I like between different cultures and I can make a sort of subculture or an alternative way of of living to my own tailoring because I have that privilege of being from two uh, separate uh, places. But I think when it comes to people's, when you talk about uh, identity or I guess the 
uh, people growing up in, I guess, mixed identity and not really yeah. knowing a lot of there's there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. Like you have both advantages and disadvantages. And yeah. I think that you have to be willing to kind of set aside the the, the traumas or the triggers that you have faced mm-hmm. in your experience and know that it's honestly never about you it's about the other person yeah and for me because I had the privilege of living abroad where my identity marker was never really foregrounded Mm. it didn't have such a profound effect on me when I moved back here but it definitely was an an eyebrow raise when I came I was like oh this is interesting really so eyebrow raise here but not overseas no yeah interesting Mm -hmm. so I would say that in terms of what they could do is that Pick the best parts of both uh, uh, aspects of your identity and mm-hmm. straddle them comfortably. Oscillate yeah. between the two very comfortably. And yeah. I would, that was, that's where I would start. <laughs> that's a great answer. I love that so much because I feel like people often, you know, we, we often get these questions of like, why don't you speak Arabic? Why aren't we speaking Arabic right now? Mm-hmm. You know, there's like certain judgments that you feel like, well, and then you have to start explaining to these people. Well, because, you know, I grew up in um, an American school. You grew up in Brussels. Like there are so many different different factors I literally had that the other day no way I I, yeah I I literally had that the other day which is so funny and it's frustrating a little Mm. bit you know what do you think like a how do you think people should kind of digest that like I know people don't mean it in a bad way when they say why don't you speak Arab I know they don't mean it in like a savage way but they're Mm -hmm. trying to like make a point of like you're Arab you should be, be proud to be Arab how do you think people can be be proud to be Arab or be proud to be whatever, you know, they are like, is the thing is, what do you think they can be doing? Well, if we think about Arabness in general, there's, Mm. I guess, a criteria or a checklist that one can follow. If Arabic sits at the top of that list, that is a, is a sort of thing that you have to check off to, in order to reinforce or at least prove your Arabness, Mm. go down that list and find other aspects of what makes you Arab and lean into those. So for me, it's like, if I talk about, for example, Emirati identity, I don't think of it in terms of wearing the abaya or, um, you know, speaking in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think of it more of the amazing uh, characteristics and attributes that Emiratis hold, which is the idea of hospitality, the idea of generosity, Mm -hmm. the idea of being uh, open and welcoming to all cultures and being Mm -hmm. able to reside and sit comfortably with so many different um, subcultures uh, whilst retaining your sense of self. And so I lead with that. Like the pride comes through there. It doesn't come through, um, you know, how I, what I think of when I, you know, go down to the desert or ride a camel. Like it's not, it's not, it doesn't break down in that way. Those are great aspects of it, but they don't necessarily ring true to what it, what I believe what it means to be Emirati, which is generosity, hospitality, Mm. kindness, um, consistency and uh, diligence. Like that's what it means. So I lead with that. So Mm -hmm. if you think of Arabic at the top of the list and those kind of follow, lean into those. And then the other ones won't really fall by the wayside, but they'll like dim down the light a little bit so that yeah. people will associate you or affiliate you with other markers. That's a really good way to do it because then also these are your values. These yeah. are not just Arab values. Mm-hmm. They could become your just natural values as, as a human being. Absolutely, yeah. And you know what I love about this also is that, I mean, this comes kind of with a because negative backdrop because of all the shit that's, I can cuss, it's fine. <laughs> I, all the shit that's happening. I'm like, am I at work or am I on this bike? <laughs> um, all the stuff that's happening in Syria, Lebanon, you know, currency fails here, mm-hmm. war there, blah, blah, blah. How do you think the future looks like in terms of like just, just globalization? Are we all going to become <laughs> one nationality? Like, are we, do you think we're all going to become this like cappuccino colored? Do you know what I mean? Uh, This enmeshed kind of Levantian or Gulf kind of culture? It's interesting you should say that because I read a statistic. uh, I can't remember where it was published, but it said that by 2030 in the US, Mm -hmm. the most, uh, the the common or the majority ethnic group will be the Latinos. Like they will sort of supersede um, you know, uh, white or black, uh, in terms of the, the racial, um, Why is standard, that? it just, it just was that okay. way. And so I found that really fascinating because when you think of, 
uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds or, or colorism within c- cultures and communities, mm. the fact that one is going to supersede the other at some point and become the majority, I think will really shift the way that we look at what it means to be, you know, American or what it means to be mm. British or what it means to be English. And I think when it comes to Arab identity, there is such a huge difference. And this is why, you know, we thank the West for putting us all into one umbrella, which yeah. is the Middle East. But mm-hmm. when we think of it, we've got, you know, the Levant and we've got the the Gulf. And, yep. and they are totally different to one another. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have similarities in terms of language. And, and I guess uh, we could talk about high context versus low context cultures. Mm-hmm. And... Um, but when we talk about, you know, the Levant, the very open, very um, uh, receptive to, you know, change, they embrace yeah. change. They're very, um, the the intellectual stimulation that you get in in the sort of enlightenment period within the mm-hmm. Levant, like Bilal Sham, like yeah. it's fascinating. And then in the Gulf, it's, it's there's this like assertiveness and yeah. uh, uh, dominance that comes with pride in holding your head and have, and there's almost like this undertone of stoicism that exists within the Gulf. Mm. And so when we think about Arab identity, when you have the, the, the mishmash of the two, I think the first conversation will be like, okay, how can we coexist in terms of what divides us? How can we acknowledge what divides us mm-hmm. before we can acknowledge what unites us? Mm-hmm. And I think that will then kind of bridge the gap of whether or not we'll end up as a cappuccino, as yeah. you said. Like, <laughs> and also the fact that the map is changing a little mm-hmm. bit, you know, the map could be changing for the next, in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And I like what you said where, you know, acknowledge the differences, say, okay, we do things this way, you guys do things that way or whatever it is. And then, but this is what we're going to build on. Mm-hmm. And this is how we're going to become strong. And, you know, our value is going to be kind of untouchable I, w- I wanted to just just yeah so sorry to cut you Go off ahead. I wanted to say something about you said the map is changing this is really fascinating um during my uh, master's degree I was researching this um this writer and a person who was interested in computational analysis and he was working um around maps or the idea of how computation can change the way that we perceive borders and mm. sense of place and the idea of displacement and his name was Benjamin H. Bratton and he wrote about how sort of every accident is a new accident and that whatever we end up changing is this sort of new normal and we have to adapt to this new normal right but the adaptation of that you have to sacrifice something in order to get to that it's almost like if you picture it as a as a pendulum swinging, Mm. it has to swing so far to one direction in order for it to come back in another direction. So Mm. when we talk about cultural change or shift, I think there needs to be something that happens that kind of circles back in order for there to be a new normal that we discover. And so, yeah, I thought of it that way. I know that's a good way to think about it. My pessimistic mind (laughs) is going like, well, does that mean that, you know, all the wars and everything that's happening right now politically, is that what's pushing us is that is that the thrusting whatever like the pendulum is that what's I don't know what do you think I think it's both it's both part and parcel I think it has a lot to do with it but I also think that I mean if we move away from the idea of like war and devastation I think the 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 dissemination of the I'm information. I'm thinking about war and de- devastation, but you can think of something else. So you, you, no, no, but I'm, you- I'm, I'm, I'm segueing from that into like, you know, I think of it more in, in terms of the dissemination of, of war and devastation through social media. I think mm-hmm. that is a bigger, like AI, and that is okay. a bigger pill that we have to swallow. And that's a bigger thing that we have to tackle because, I mean, there are so many things that happen through social media that I could very well say is allows the young generation or even us to be under the sort of social contagion of being obsessed or or looking at news in a way that can steer our general opinion and can manipulate the way that we think about things so yes there's a lot of things going on externally whether it's war and devastation but it's the exposure to it the desensitized uh, way of looking at things the normalization of certain things that that changes who we are inherently as people yeah. and we become so numb to things that we see because we we are just like oversaturated with oversaturated content. and regurgitating mm-hmm. stuff that we don't even might not believe mm-hmm. um 
Okay, I like what you what you said about social media, and I want to get into that because you have a very interesting Instagram page. The letters. Do I? Oh, well, thank you very kindly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the letters, the letters project. It is yes. Um, the letters project is very. I mean, I went on that page and I was like, "This is great," because people are talking about their private lives in public mm-hmm. anonymously. Their secrets are out there, but nobody knows who they are because there's no face to the letter that they're putting out there. Mm-hmm. What have you found is the reaction to such like just blatant, like, you know, telling of people's private lives, like someone who's, you know, giving you information about their like marriage or their religion or what do you what have you seen in the reaction in the comments and people's like, is there a rhetoric that you have seen that is like a pattern? What's interesting about the Letters Project is, and I, I've said this before on my on my own uh, podcast, but that social media incentivizes binary thinking. You mm-hmm. either are with us or against us. You yeah. either agree or disagree. Yep. And I think with the Letters Project, the comment section is not I agree or disagree. It is the gray in between. It's like I somewhat agree, but I have my own thoughts and anecdotes that I want to interject. And then someone else will come in and chime in their two cents. So you actually get a dialogue going. So yeah. I think the reaction overarchingly for the Letters project has been quite positive because it allows for the discussion to take place whilst maybe before that would only happen behind closed doors or would happen in very uh, small spaces between trusted friends Mm -hmm. now it's kind of out there open and in the early stages of the letters project people used to follow with their finsters or fake accounts and I feel like over the past couple of years people have started to associate and affiliate by way of their actual like public profiles and so when they comment they're commenting as their as themselves wow and so you get to see people's real opinions and real thoughts about specific subjects that's like really breaking down like shame just the shame to be even involved in like a conversation that might be taboo Mm -hmm. they've just kind of they've let it go Mm -hmm. absolutely so i think that if anything it's it's allowed for these types of discussions to take place Mm. which i think is more than anyone could ask for do we have the the sort of the yay team and then the 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 antithesis of that Mm -hmm. the the naysayers and the ones that are really like you know um helping the letters project progress yes we have both and they do think they are very opinionated and we've had moments I'm not so sure how long you follow the letters project but I mean it's been shut down like three almost like I think three or four times really yeah and it's gone through the ringer so is it just because of the comment section yes because I mean people report it and then of course with the algorithm Mm. it gets shut down and it is a nightmare to bring back but it's the process of bringing it back only reinforces the idea that there is a hunger for this type of conversation to take place so I think that you know we're going to keep keep bringing it back online as much as we can and then (laughs) keep bringing it back. Yeah. At some point it's, it's funny. I was talking to a friend about this and she had said, you know, the letters project to her is a socio anthropological case study of the region. It it really is. And I was going to ask you like, what have you learned from the stuff that you've seen? And I'm sure because you get the letters, right? So you have to filter out. Yeah. So what what have you, what have you seen that maybe we haven't seen? I've like, seen everything. You've seen I, yeah. everything. You anything under the rising sun? I have seen names, like people name pe- naming people. Like I could walk down the street and like be like, I know exactly what happened to oh you. Oh my god! Yeah, goodness. it's but but what's interesting about it, and I've said this before on, on, on different discussions. I was like, I am a vault. Like when it comes yeah, to yeah. the latest project, the things that I know, no human should know. But. Okay. Um, but a lot of stuff happened behind the scenes of the Letters Project, especially before it got shut down the last time. Mm. There were, you know, um, therapists, um, lawyers, uh, you know, people in the mental health profession helping people who had sent letters and then self-identified in the DMs and then would help kind of facilitate any kind of help that they were looking for. So there were a lot of things happening behind the scenes. Okay, that's amazing because mm-hmm. that's exactly what we need in this I mean, you know, you can't expect change to happen overnight, Mm -hmm. but this is kind of just spinning the wheel behind closed doors. True, but people didn't know that. So I think... I think that, of course, with social media and people living in a very, you know, narcissistic day and age, they always want to showcase, you know, they want to put their best foot forward on social media. They want Mm. to be able to show like, this is me in my greatest stage. Look at what my accomplishments are. Like, look Mm. at what I've I've accomplished. Look at what uh, I've succeeded, etc. But with the Letters Project, it's very understated. Like, it's not... 
it's very bashful in the way that it presents itself and it yeah. just kind of inserts a letter and then allows it to sort of take like the the conversations to take place it doesn't it's very neutral in its belief system yeah so people don't know how much work goes on behind the scenes but i feel like that is so relevant to the just our arab arab community like how people kind of relate to each other everything's very private here like mm -hmm. you, you you know you value your privacy and you know some people don't even um tell their family certain things their close friends so mm -hmm. i feel like this is literally kind of just their space like their open space um what i mean where do you see it going do you do you feel like you might print it or something or like so the latest project actually <laughs> it's uh it's a company now so oh. it's um it can function as many different i guess uh avenues we can go down many different avenues mm -hmm. or different verticals and one of them is um it can be you know an online platform we mm -hmm. can deal with you know seminars and webinars mm -hmm. we can also deal in publication uh, we can deal in uh, group sessions, uh, discussions, and, and we've had several ones. We've had ones at Pause in Dubai, um, wow. like in Jumeirah, mm -hmm. and these closed sessions where people can come in and, and we'll have discussions about certain topics that people have inserted, but we don't know who the person is in the room. I was going to say, like, do, do they ever like reveal themselves? Do you know? We've had, we've had certain people that have felt comfortable enough to reveal themselves and okay. it's just been met with love and wow. acceptance and, you know, support. And it's wow, just been that gave me shivers. Yeah. I it's been amazing that. and um i remember one of the sessions there was this woman that came through who drove all the way from from abu dhabi which i was you know very you know just blown away by yeah um and she was talking about how she had endured um a relationship that was physically abusive okay but we didn't know that it was her we mm -hmm. were discussing the subject uh openly and because of course we don't know who the person is when they're in the room yeah um and then in the end she chimed in sort of her opinion and then just kind of broke down and then was crying and said you know i was the person that wrote the letter and everyone Ooh. was just filled with like hugs and you know words of affirmation and points of validation and it was just so beautiful to witness that is amazing yeah, that is a great. nice therapy session yeah <laughs> definitely it's like if you want a brief therapy session just show up just show up let us project that's where you need to be you know that's amazing what made you want to do that what made you like just think of having a project like that was that a part of a kind of a bigger project or it was by was accident just, actually just by, yeah. yeah it was by accident I was living in London in 27 like between 2016 and 2017 mm -hmm. and I used to use Instagram stories as a way to state my opinion about certain things I would yep. go and see things and just like uh, chime in my two cents and then people would always dm me being like oh i echo your sentiment or i have an anecdote that aligns with what you're saying okay. and then it got to the point where some of them were just so fascinating i would ask them if i could share it and yeah. they said yes but with, no, don't show my name and then uh, people started asking me uh every once in a while oh i read that thing that you posted the other day because it has a 24-hour window cycle right right so um they would say you know after 24 hours oh there was this amazing thing but it's gone like can you repost it so I put it as a highlight on my Instagram mm. and then that just kept getting so much traction and then I was like oh just you know and thus you know the letters project was born that's amazing mm -hmm. awesome all right let's talk about um feminism sure feminism and, and we're gonna go into something beyond that mm -hmm. so uh what is going on right now in the west you know the me too movement you know, the feminist movement, everything that's happening that we see online. Like we have it here, but it's not as kind of potent. You know, it's not really as demanding as what is going on over there. Mm -hmm. But we have one thing that is kind of really detrimental to what's to our society, mm -hmm. which I think is internal misogyny. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this still exists in our society with everything that we are going through, the evolution, the changes? Why do you think it's there's there are females who are so kind of, they've held on to a certain set of values and they are just refuse to let it go. And I see it in the way that they raise their sons and the way they treat their husbands and the way they see things, the way they they even like, you know, I'll, I'll challenge you as a female because, you know, my internal misogyny tells me this. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that still exists? Like, what is, what is our problem? <laughs> Oh, that's a it's a it's a loaded question. Loaded. So I'll, I'll I'll unpack it right, from right. from from you know yeah. many different avenues. Okay, so in terms of feminism, I always say this. I can only only speak for myself. Yeah. I am not a feminist. Mm -hmm. I do not agree with this like modern day feminism that has kind of 
I guess, swept the uh, trickled from the West into the way that we understand feminism mm -hmm. in the Arab world, because we had feminism before anyone even assigned a term to it. And it was so ancestral and it was something that we we understood so clearly and so diligently from our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers. And it was passed down and disseminated as as a way to combat survival or a way to compete against survival. Mm -hmm. And so for us, the idea of being assertive and multifaceted and, you know, brave and courageous and all of those things, those are qualities that I would associate with, with femininity okay. and not necessarily with masculinity exclusively. Mm -hmm. So when I think of the, the women that have really gone against the grain and done things that I would view as quite highbrow or contrarian or anti-conformist. It's always mm -hmm. been the women. But the way that we understand feminism now is we are striving towards having women that are more authoritarian women rather than mm -hmm. egalitarian women. Mm -hmm. And we... Explain what egalitarian okay, is. So, <laughs> so authoritarian is obviously like in terms of authority, like um, uh, trying to dominate. Yes. Yeah. Egalitarian is like uh, wanting to be on an equal playing field with right. the masculine. So we have the feminine, we want to be equal with the masculine. Got it. So women want to equate themselves to men. And what has happened with feminism is that in order to be a, like a raging feminist mm -hmm. nowadays, you have to dismantle what it means to be masculine. You either have to um, feminize men in, and and mask emas uh, and masculate women in yep. order to understand feminism, and it's like, well, if you think about it that way, then you are allowing for um, a masculine receptive energy to dominate mm -hmm. and and mansplain what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a feminist yeah. now nowadays. And so for me, I don't agree with that. I think you ha we have to have men alongside us in order to truly understand what it means to be. Um, uh, in order to understand what it truly means to be, to have a partnership 100%. with the yin and the yang, the masculine and the feminine. We cannot negate masculinity in order to bring up femininity. This is what I don't understand in, in Western cultures because I feel like, you know, the traditional masculine and feminine roles have worked for years in creating families and creating, you know, great structures for homes and everyone was happy. What happened? <laughs> like what, what, what went on? And I, the thing is here, I feel like it's, we're a bit more accepting of like, it is what it is. The man is this and the woman is that. And that's what we do, mm -hmm. right? Like it's the, the challenge is not really, we, we don't, because, because we have a good, mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's a great way to live, to, to be in your feminine energy and for the masculine, for, for him to be in his energy. This is good for society. Mm -hmm. This is good for like balance and, and equilibrium. Internalized misogyny is in the nuance. It's mm. not in, and the way you can look at it is like the devil is in the details. Right. So it doesn't come out as this kind of loud and unapologetic way of looking at things. Mm. It's it's in the subtle nuances of the way that we interact with our day-to-day -day, um, women. Okay. An example of that would be, and I've used this before, uh, it's kind of, I'm trying to uh, connect the dots with the Letters Project. Yep. So. With the Letters Project, there was a letter that someone had written about needing permission to gain uh, contraceptive pills, but needing the signature of the husband in order mm. to be able to um, to get them from her doctor. Okay. Uh, whether this was true or not, I mean, this was just one of the letters. Mm -hmm. And the comment section was the the most unique and uh, and a uh, polarizing example that I had ever witnessed in all the years that the Letters Project has oh, been so around. Excited. You had the women that were very much like bodily autonomy. You don't need a man's permission to 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 get uh, contraceptive pills or to, to do anything with your body. It is, you are a sovereign human being. You exist as your own entity. Uh, no one should have the right to speak on behalf of what you do with your body, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And then you had the other end of the spectrum, which is like, of course you need the, hus the husband's permission. How dare you try and take away the opportunity for him to have a child by by lying to him and deceiving him and getting on the contraceptive pill, of course he has to sign it off to you. Oh, wow. And and the women that were saying uh, on this end of the sort of camp, and then you had the women on this end of the pack were just at each other's throats about it. Oh. And I found it fascinating because all of these women just di displayed so much internalized misogyny because mm. they would they were they were socially programmed to believe yep. that they do not have bodily autonomy and that they their belief system is the only belief system that should be 
reinforced because for me, the way that I, I envision it, there's almost like an undertone of hypervigilance yeah. in the sense that it's almost like they feel like this is the only way to this exist. The only way, and this is because that's how they've been brought up. That's all they Ex know. Exactly. And they do not want to d deviate from the plan that was set for them mm. because either in fear of, you know, rejection, the unknown, um, what society will deem as, you know, disapproving, etc. And I think that in this side of the camp, the one that was sort of like anti, I like, you know, um, contraceptive pill and like yay for bodily autonomy, mm -hmm. they believed in more sort of like, in individualism in that you are your own person and you operate as yourself and you don't have to represent the, the, the community or the tribe or, or mm. the society at large. Um, yeah. but in this camp, it was more like, what will the community think of you when you do this? What would the family think of you? What will your husband think of you? Mm. And it was very much keeping their personal thoughts at bay and, and allowing for society to dictate what they should do. Whilst yeah. this was like, no, my personal thoughts are more important and societies at bay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a double edged wow, sword. Wow, I would have loved to see the comment section in that. Mm -hmm, that was, <laughs> I think it was like a letter that was written, oh my God, two years, like a year and a half ago, something like that. But okay. write a letter to the Lessons Project. No one will know it's you. So I'm gonna might do as it. well. Yeah. I'm not telling anybody or when I'm gonna do it, but you guys should. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> should sure. be fun. You did this TED talk in Ajman. Yes. Right? Um, and you were talking about, you know, being in an Arab culture um, whilst trying to live kind of a Western lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? And kind of like the, the dichotomy in that or kind of like having to navigate the the what's going on now with like the multiculturalism and people, mm -hmm. new people coming in and having to melt you know uh, having to tolerate and da -da -da -da, understand other cultures mm -hmm. people who are like you know who haven't really who are scared who who haven't who haven't been out and who have, have lived in the same you know country for all their lives which is there's nothing wrong with that i'm just you know including those people in the conversation mm -hmm. how do you uh try to figure out your own unique perspective in this like sea of craziness um and pers sea of perspectives actually it's a sea of like just saturated perspectives i mean what you're technically asking is how do you navigate the matrix and i think Actually. um i think it's really really hard in this day and age because nothing that you read on social media can actually stem from a hundred percent truth mm. you will always have people's opinions and thoughts and ideologies interjected in whatever it is you're looking at and so you have to have a learned mindset of being able to know what intrinsically resides in your wheelhouse of what you think is right and wrong and what mm. your ideologies and belief system are. It depends on, of course, when we talk about, because you mentioned social media, yeah. it depends on what demographic you're, you're addressing. If it's children, parents need to be aware of what their children are looking at and digesting online mm -hmm. because everything now is a social contagion. You are absorbing it, digesting it, mm -hmm. living that, and then you become, um, you become sort of, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? You, you become so malleable to these types mm. of uh, conversations that happen online. And you have this kind of wave of, of getting riled up and, uh, you know, then you, subjective reality is the only reality that you can view things from and yeah. objectivity isn't part of the conversation, but then it is. And then, you know, there's so many ways there's about so much it. going on. And so I think that there's too many cooks right now and they're spoiling the broth. Yep. And I think we need to go back on what is what is true and what is an absolute. And I mean, of course, we can make the argument the only thing in life that is absolute is like life and death. Yep. That is the only thing that we can think of. But when we think about it, you know, in terms of who we are as people, what biology is, mm -hmm. what, um, what we understand as non-negotiable factual evidence, mm -hmm. we have to, we, we cannot be able to, we can't rock that boat because we have to stay grounded in that belief system because that is reality. It's not a form of reality. It is reality. Yeah. And then everything else is just uh, extra fluff, you know? I like what you said about, you know, forming your own mindset first before trying to take on or ingesting other stuff that's online because that's where the danger lies. Like you just taking on everyone else's perspective, you're left with you're left with empty, you're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. Like you need to make up your own mind by reading books, watching, you know, um, 
independent films like just do the research do your due diligence before taking on other people's opinions because the fact of the matter is that most people's opinions are actually you've you've seen this before like you're you're taking on someone else's opinion anyway yes. it's, it's never your own um and what i suggest to people is to to educate themselves no matter you know don't rely on social media it's not your yes. like it's not gonna guide you it's not <laughs> and it's also like it's testing the limit it, it's testing the limitations of things that we have surpassed years and years and years ago this idea that like oh we can only have an attention span of 2.5 seconds now yeah. so it's if you hold heartedly feel triggered by things that you watch in short f format, challenge yourself to watch long format content. Because mm. a lot of the things, even for my own self, when I've looked at different podcasts or people that have stated their opinions, I always revert to long format. I don't like to have things pulled out of context because then I don't understand the the, the key messages that they're trying to get across because I don't have any, um, I have no like uh, uh, framework to, yeah. to, to, to navigate from. So- I think that's the most important thing. But I also think also leave your ego at the door because yeah. yes, you can take on people's uh, like other people's opinions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But if you feel a certain way about something, whether it's rooted in reality or your reality or subjective reality uh, or a form of truth, you have to hold heartedly believe it to the extent that you better, you know, damn well sure know that you can back it up in a conversation because if you can't defend it and you have no way of supporting it and bringing the sort of academic or scholarly receipts as one would like to argue, yep. then you have no leg in, you have no stick in the game. Like you might as well sit down and not state your opinion at that's, all. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. I've, I totally am with you on that because that's happened to me. Like sometimes I've like, I, I'll just... I'll regurgitate something that I've heard, like maybe when I was in college where I was like really passionate about like, you know, certain topics mm -hmm. topics, and and I would get, get an argument. And then I was like, wait a minute. When someone gives it back to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, why did I think like, you know, like y there is no backup mm -hmm. there. It's just kind of something that you you hear and it's such an ugly way to be in a conversation so, so what happened to debate what happened like, to every, debate? like you know okay we can agree to disagree we can have a conversation and i don't have to necessarily agree with everything that you say but i can give you the respect that you deserve to listen to your side and then perhaps find the middle ground of where we can both align mm -hmm. and and i feel like when it comes to social media um there is no way for people, th there is no room for somebody to invite somebody else's conversation forward. This is what boggles me because I'm like, don't you like it when you are kind of proven wrong sometimes and you learn something new? Like, isn't that? Yes, but if we're living in a narcissistic time where yeah. the young generation has lived their entire lives on social media, no. then they feel so entitled to their thoughts and ideas that they are disinterested in what you have to say. They, yeah. they are so consumed with, projecting and making a public service announcement to what they believe that they love the sound of their own voice and that's why they're there they're not there for a conversation they're there just to make a statement of course they're not there for a conversation because if you put everyone in the same room they would not be talking like this if mm -hmm. you put them face to face there's no way they would say the crap that they would say online um, yeah tell me now in your research mm -hmm. um what what questions would you like what is your goal out of the research that you do what would you like people to start asking about what would you like people to be curious about well what's interesting about the research that i do is i'm fascinated by carving out space for research that hasn't existed before mm -hmm. to sit comfortably in the bed of academics and scholarly research mm -hmm. when we talk even about you know basic things like whether it's identity or anthropology or ethnography or even like, you know, intersexual dynamics between men and women mm -hmm. in the dating market, there is hardly any data coming from the region because people don't necessarily do research here. Mm -hmm. We can talk through the lens of anecdotes. We can talk through the lens of, um, you know, a few studies here and there, but a strong foundation that is the bedrock of what we, what we know and to be true or to be the, I guess, uh, the point of departure for these types of conversation, those things don't exist. So for me, my research first and foremost is to inform. So mm -hmm. I am just creating a space to inform things that haven't been documented before, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to identity. I mean, there's other aspects that I'm researching now, which is like cultural nuances, intangible heritage, because at some point, you know, intangible heritage has to be tangible. You know, we got to- What do you mean by intangible heritage? As in like uh, untraceable- 
Uh, data or um, heritage that is by way of like oral histories oh. that I want to be able to sort of document it in a way that we have a clear understanding of where things came from. And if, and, and, and that can be through anything. Like I, I was doing some research on, on henna, like the, the origins yeah. of henna and like where that comes from. And I'm still kind of, I've parked that to the side so I can finish off my methodology of the research that I'm doing right now. Okay. But, um, so there's so many things that I've been fascinated by. It's, yeah. It just stems from curiosity. I was just going to say, you know, the letters project can also be kind of taken and done for like a dating in Dubai page mm -hmm. because all the quote I'm at, I get so many questions, people saying like, you need to get this person on your podcast. You talk about dating in Dubai. I'm like, look, I'm, I don't want to talk about this anymore because it's just a mind effort, you know, I, it's just, it's, and, but it's a fun topic. Obviously it's a fun topic, but like, it would be so great to have a page where people can just put in their questions and maybe we should start that. I mean, actually that's, that's, <laughs> that's something that I'm doing right now, um, with mentality, which is a, um, a podcast that, uh, one of the founders, one of the co-founders, uh, Corey Lindsay had started about opening up the conversation of the sexual marketplace and the dating sphere mm. for men in Dubai to be able to discuss openly about where they sit and their thoughts and their positions it against the sort of backdrop of, of dating women and, mm. and how that, how it's very difficult to kind of navigate what it means to be masculine nowadays. Mm. And um, so the Lessons Project is kind of working alongside of that, trying to create that a healthy space. So that's, that's already cool. in the works. That's We're like trying to, trying to do something. So it's very exciting. That's really exciting because then it's like without judgment also. Because I, I do yes. feel for men sometimes that they get, you know, we do not hold back when it comes to like, judging oh i definitely feel like there's war there's a war against masculinity which yeah. is why it's like it's a double-edged sword there's war against masculinity and then the women not feeling that they have a safe space to exist and mm -hmm. then men kind of like retracting that and then you have the incels and and whatnot and then you have the women here that are like trying to promote trad wives whilst in this region it's always been here you know like we promote what sorry trad wives traditional wives oh yeah yeah. yeah you okay. know they're like it's like this thing in the west now they're like hashtag trad wives I'm oh like, my god we have been doing that we are since this. the dawn of day <laughs> Maybe Stop. come to the Middle East yeah, where I we just, do this. Yeah. So. Oh God, that's so true. You know, all these TikToks that I've been seeing recently about like being your feminine, um, yeah. cook for him. I don't, I'm like, we've been doing this. I'm like, sabah al khair. Yeah, hello. Like come to like a just Syrian household world. or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> normal. Yeah. And I, I just found, that's why I find it so fascinating. Because even when we talk about people in the field of podcasting, mm -hmm. a lot of them are they're, they're coming at it from a very Eurocentric mindset or yeah. very Western centric, um, uh, like a case study or, or, or research. And then I think to myself, like, you know, guys, like the stuff that you're discussing is still very much part of the fabric of Arab identity. Like we 100%. very much believe this. We don't buy into, you know, the BS that you guys are spinning. Yeah. And also trad wives, like literally come to like a sitat and amad party with all the like mamas Jordan, and babas. Yeah. Literally. It's like <laughs> hashtag Trav wives galore, you know? <laughs> but so, yeah, I just, that's so funny. Okay. Um, what do you, what do you want to do next? What's next for you? Like, what do you feel like you, cause you said you were working on a project and you were working next with the letters project, you know, there's something in tandem to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what else are, are you doing? Because you wrote a book. I did, yes. What is the book about? We haven't talked about it, that. It's, yeah, it's a lot. Like, look, I like I said, I just like, I dip my toes into so many different things. Mm -hmm. I've also, so I have always self-identified as an artist mm -hmm. and I've been, you know, an artist in, in the field for a very long time, but I've come to realize that the art sphere, the art sphere here, um, or at least within the region, it has an underbelly of toxicity that I just don't align myself with very much so. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of decided to branch out into aspects that still enforce my creativity, but in just different avenues. So okay. the book was one of them. My social anthropology research was another, you know, the Lessons Project was a different trajectory. So all these different verticals that I'm trying to experiment, I don't think creativity is just under fine art no. or design. It can disseminate into so many aspects of, of, creative uh exploration totally agree with that totally agree because i feel like if you are a creative person by nature you need to do those different things yes like you it's it's hard to find for example an actor or singer or artist that is tied down to one form of medium of creativity it hardly happens actually mm -hmm. um and i know what you mean about the toxicity within the creative community. creative community it's there's yeah i mean it's kind of weird that there's it's a con like 
in creativity, there is such a openness and tolerance and vulnerability, but then to have it be criticized and have that toxicity is just, it's counterproductive. I think it's really, it's not good. And I think also within the creative community, um, that we've experienced, there's a lot of competitiveness that doesn't need to uh, that's be there. what I was trying to say too. You know, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. enough room for everybody to sit at the table mm -hmm. just because you're sitting there and there's like a pie, you're not taking somebody's slice of pie. There's a pie for everyone. There's a slice for everyone. And I think that to really embrace what collective community is mm -hmm. or um, what it what it means to be under an umbrella of a collective mm -hmm. is to really embrace wholeheartedly and really advocate for meritocracy, not nepotism. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I'm seeing more is the steer towards nepotism than meritocracy. Okay, meritocracy, you mean, would, can you give us, like, just tell us what you, yes. that means? Yes, so what I mean is that meritocracy is that people are succeeding and and really going on to amazing things, climbing up social ladders by way of merit. They're doing it off their own backs. Their own accomplishments. Yes, but whilst nepotism is more sort of like, you know, I have friends or family members or affiliations that I just slot into these positions. Yeah just by way of association and affiliation, not by merit. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what, and I also believe, and this is what I've experienced for myself, is that people who know me know that I am like the biggest cheerleader for, I will champion anyone. I will be the the gun for hire, the ride, mm -hmm. ride or die. And I will do it with no expectation that it will come back my way. I Great. do it because I, out of the graciousness of my own, like tender, tender heart. But what I found is the more that I was doing it, the second that I stopped doing it, nothing came my way. Mm. I had no, no one was sort of coming. I could count on like really very small amount of hands. So do you of, think that you're being taken advantage of basically? Not really just taken advantage of. It's more along the lines of that the people, same people, courtesy that yeah. I've bestowed upon other people has not been reciprocated. reciprocated in a way that really advocates and champions for like an e a creative ecosystem where we're mm. all advocating for each other and supporting each other. And so that is why I've like respectfully withdrawn from at least uh, the art scene for now mm -hmm. and doing my own thing and working on my own artistic passions because I don't want it to kill how I view. Like your art is beautiful. Thank honestly. you so much. I it's beautiful. That. It reminds me of, uh, well, Jordanian, the Wadi Ram, the, oh, the okay. lines, because you have the lines. Yes. And I thought that's so interesting. I'm like, how does she do it? And then I saw you doing the car, you carve out the paint. I from do, yes. The, where can people see your art? I mean, I've kind of like uh, uh, emptied out. I did like a like a Facebook uh, and Instagram genocide where I removed all of my artistic pictures. But, oh, really? um, <laughs> but you can find it on my website. Okay. But for me, um, ev even the subject of that within the creatives field, like I am not a gatekeeper. You okay. ask me something, I will tell you where, where it happened, where I did it, how I did it. And because I, I want you to be able to do it better than me, not because I'm, you know, I will never see you as competition. I was going to say, and like, if you're confident in what you do, then you are not going to see people as competition. Oh, you're absolutely. Like, I and, and, and the more the merrier, like if we yeah. can all get in there and start carving out paintings together, like, yay. Yeah. Like I'm, 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 I'm so happy and advocating for like singing Kumbaya by the campfire. Amazing. But, um, when I see people gatekeeping mm. or I see people thinking that like, you know, people copying or thinking that they're like, someone can hold like, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's getting it to the point where it's just egos. And yep. it's just, I'm like, no, I do not, I do not subscribe to this message. Yeah. Mar Salama, I withdraw. <laughs> bye so bye. yeah, that's my, my thoughts about it. There are so many ways to go, to go, go about this, but you know, how would you suggest, because you do a lot of creative things mm -hmm. and obviously there is the question of, you know, making a living out of being creative mm -hmm. and having to get pay your bills and having to, you know, there's, there, it's not easy. It's Wait, like, you don't get paid with exposure? Isn't that enough? No, I don't get monetized oh. by expo with oh. exposure. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, I thought, that, I thought that's what everyone did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. But like, I feel like how is, how can we do it now? How can we do it like, how have you done it? And how do you think what the way you've done it can help people? So that is something that I can definitely advocate for, especially somewhere in the UAE. There are so many platforms, grants, residencies, uh, initiatives, uh, call to actions, applications, awards, etc., that advocate for the development of emerging artists within okay. the creative field. So you just apply. There's 
Sharjah Art Foundation, there's Sheikh Salama Foundation, there's the Department of Culture and Tourism, there's the Cultural Foundation. There are so many different places that you can go mm. and seek support and you will find it there. Okay. And I think that that in, in a nutshell can really tell you how much they really want to embrace the art and culture scene. They really want to cultivate culture. Mm. Cultivate culture. Cultivate culture. There you go. <laughs> Woo! Didn't have to pay me for that. So, um, and there are just so many different events that are happening. There's Art Dubai. Uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, there's Art Dubai, Abu Dhabi Art. There's the Cultural Summit. There's so many different things that are happening yeah. in conjunction with each other or in tandem with each other yep. that you, you're never going to be shy of opportunities. There's always going to be something around the corner. That's amazing. I'm, I'm curious also about the book that you wrote. Like, yes. The, so the, we, we always like just jump. I know. From, we're just like yeah. in tangents, but it's okay. But, uh, the book... I mean, how, give us, the, tell us the process. Was that a difficult one to? Yes, yeah. definitely. It was a two year process of writing wow. and then about six months to a year of editing. And I had two beta readers, which are people that kind of come in and read and go like, this works, this doesn't, see if you can expand on that. And it was just, it's, um, it's fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it's loosely based on experiences that I've gone through for my own, you know, my own life. And, mm -hmm. uh, there's a few people that have the book because I haven't, um, Published. I've, I haven't physically, <laughs> I haven't properly gone into like full blown production, but right. I've published a small, um, conservative amount and I give yeah. it out to friends and get ideas about it. But yeah. it was a definitely a cathartic experience to say the least. Like it must really have enjoyed hard. it. For someone who's creative, I feel like, don't you get a little bit ADHD? Like you want to like move around like sitting you have to sit down for two years and write a book I didn't sit down and this is something you're like I stood up <laughs> uh, I did I, I walked around and okay. this is something um so I am severely severely dyslexic okay I have dyslexia dyspraxia and ADHD full-blown very common in creatives yes, by the way yes and actually my master's degree it was like 80 percent of the people at the university uh the college had uh had any form of sort of uh I, I, I wouldn't even call it like a deficiency deficiency. I thought it was like, it's just, it's great, mm -hmm. but super ADHD, super, um, uh, dyslexic and dyspraxic. And my dyslexia was so bad that when I did my dissertation, when I wrote my thesis, I audio dictated it oh. and then, and that's how I wrote my book. So really vast majority of the, the book is, um, wow. so your, that means your verbal fluency is way stronger than your like literal, like sitting to write because oh, you, you yeah so you learn or you know by speaking mm -hmm. that's yeah. very interesting <clears throat> i'll give it to you yeah <clears throat> no no, no I'll, I'll give it to you the the, the opening of the book oh, yeah um there's something alive and breathing about oil on canvas the lines draw you in like ocean waves and before you know it you're drowning in the storm of its ridges i learned to speak through my hands before words told themselves where to go they dance and shape everything I say before me as if I was to draw a picture for you of them in thin air. It's hard for me, therefore, to write this. Words are nothing like a paintbrush. They don't dance. They march. And some nights I stumble across the melancholy that goes hand in hand with a rainy Parisian afternoon. All the way the moonlight skims the sand like a promise. Some things I can't tell you when they defy definition when given in to the custody of the eyes alone. But with my hands, I know what a masterpiece feels like against my palms. I know a woman, painted and bold, and oil and bold against your fingertips might as well be flames and silk if you weren't looking directly at her. If I was to tell you a class that I wasn't meant for, it would be fire and silk with more heat and color than substance. That was love. That was him. That was Sam. But that all came later. Chapter one. Wow. <laughs> Wait, don't tell me that was the first draft that you just spat out. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty how, much. how did that come to you? Um, I became fascinated with, um, even when I said some things I can't tell you when they defy definition when given into the custody of the eyes alone. So because I use my hands a lot, especially with my paintings, when I carve into the surface, mm. uh, the first thing that I thought of is like with, with my hands, I know what a masterpiece feels like against my palms. That was the first okay. line that kind of came to play. Yep. And that set the tone of like everything that branched out. Um, and so it's a love story. Basically, I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's a love story. Um, uh, an artist uh, who falls in love. And I think okay. that, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. People who read it, it. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll give good. you a copy. It's so poetic. I love it. It's just, but um, the way you just, is that how it came out the first time? 
Yeah, pretty much. I'm yeah. sorry. Like I'm asking you because I'm like, how did you? Yeah, do pretty it? much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I pieced wow. together a few things here and there. But that's were you all. a very uh, like avid reader when you were young? Yes, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. I prefer now like audiobooks because of the reading like uh, reading was such a difficult thing for me because of my dyslexia yeah and I used to go I I was behind in reading for so much um I'm dyslexic in all languages which is really unfortunate um which didn't really help with my driving um because obviously they tell you like left and right and I was going right instead of left and classic classic dyslexic move (laughs) uh but um and so I always kind of I became sort of like an oralist and just mm. somebody that w- learned things in a sort of autodidactic way. And that's kind of how I. It's like so it's, crazy how when you have or we, when you feel that you have a weakness in something, you overcompensate for it and you become this like master of like whatever it is that you've overcome. So like now verbal fluency yeah, is, is your the like, toast. and when I hear you speak, I'm like, this girl has been reading her whole life. Like she, <laughs> yeah. it's like, she knows all the words, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's interesting. You should say this just like as a, as a comment, because I'd mentioned this in another discussion I had, mm. my biggest insecurity as a child was being misunderstood. And and I think it was because of my personality and my mannerisms mm. and the way that I was like, everyone would just kind of pigeonhole me or put me into a certain box. Okay. And one aspect of that misunderstanding journey was my need to overemphasize or rearticulate something over and over again to someone. So they would be absolutely sure of exactly what I meant when mm. I meant it. So that's why I take great pride but also very diligent when it comes to me explaining something. Like I will use the correct term in the correct, correct place um so that there is no miss like there's no there's no room yeah no room for error yep and uh so that's why i kind of like over explain things that's really interesting because i have the like i have the opposite really it's so i was an avid reader when i was young Mm -hmm. um and but i had my speech wasn't great okay my speech was a bit like even when i was young i was very quiet i didn't Mm. speak for a very long time (laughs) I so opposite. My mom was like, you started speaking before you could even walk. It's like, you wouldn't shut up. And I was like, well, it hasn't changed. And then even because I moved to Australia at a very young age and my English wasn't great. And I was always called out first in class to oh, read, the worst. to read out certain lines. And I was like, fuck my life. Like now I have to speak in front of everyone. It's the worst. And it was the worst. Mm-hmm. But then it gave me, I was like, this is always going to be hard. This is always me speaking is always going to be hard. But look at you now. Oh, look at me now. You're just like <laughs> on your own little podcast right now. But that's what I'm saying. It's because I feel like that weakness or what I perceived to be as something that was a bit delayed. Yeah. Just kind of flourished. And then I thought maybe it's just like I've been just ingesting information to be able to express it kind of thing. And maybe that's what you did too. I mean, look at you. You're like asking the questions, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. You know, like... <laughs> Doing the most. Thanks. Love it. <laughs> I love that you are still doing the research and I can't wait to see what other, you know, data is going to come out next. Where can people like find you or where can they find the the findings that you're going to find? Findings. Find the findings. <laughs> so you can find me um, on Instagram, on sort of social media platforms at Sarah Allegruby. Mm-hmm. You can find me on The Native Informant, which is my podcast. And you can find The Letters Project at The Letters Project. Uh-huh. And the website is sarahallegruby.com, thelettersproject.com. And we also are on Spotify for, for my podcast, as well as YouTube, Apple Play, uh, Google, all of all of the, the bells and whistles. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Guys, if you like this episode, then do like, share, or just say a hey in the comments, and we'll see you on the next one.